You know, the most remarkable thing about science is that it works. It consistently produces reliable results that have revolutionized our species in a way that no other way of thinking ever has. A thousand years ago, humanity's capacity to communicate was limited by the amount of parchment that your bird could carry and the distance that it was strong and smart enough to traverse. Now, we can instantly send terabytes of information to people on the opposite side of the world via invisible beams of light. A thousand years ago, we envied those birds and their seemingly limitless freedom to explore the world and reach places that we could not. Now, we pity them for being constrained to a fraction of the heights that we have reached. A thousand years ago, we sacrificed animals and inhaled sacred fumes to fend off the demons who we believed were responsible for the plagues that nearly wiped us out time and time again. Now. We are the predators of the microscopic organisms whose devastating effects we once attributed to the divine. Science works. Hate the method for being so rigorous, hate the conclusions for not conforming to your expectations, but do not deny its power. Science is not perfect. It is a self-correcting enterprise, but it is ruled by some of the most rigorous standards possible. Theology and philosophy simply cannot compete with science when the goal is to construct accurate models of reality. The method that has allowed you to watch this video and hear my voice is the same method that has been used to construct the theories that creationists deny. That these other theories have not had as much of an impact on our day-to-day -day activities as quantum theory and germ theory have is irrelevant. The strength of a scientific theory is determined by how consistent it is with reality, and this consistency can be measured in terms of how well the theory fits with current data, and especially how accurately it predicts future data. That is the central point of this video, for creationists, and indeed all pseudoscientists, will attempt to subvert the scientific principles that they reject by ignoring this essential fact. It is extremely important to always keep this in mind because this is how we distinguish science from pseudoscience. If a model makes testable, potentially falsifiable predictions with parsimonious explanatory power, then it may be worth your consideration. If all that a model has, however, is ad hoc speculation that incorporates selective data mining and unfalsifiable remedies to fundamental problems, then what you're dealing with is a perversion of the scientific method. You can give a creationist all of the evidence in the world, but in the end, they will invariably play their last and most important card. You know, it really all depends on our perspective to tell us exactly what we're going to see. Here at the Creation Museum, we make no apology about the fact that our origins or historical science actually is based upon the biblical account of origins. The Grand Canyon is a big old hole in the ground, but how did it get there? Now we've got an evolutionist interpretation and a creationist interpretation. The evolutionist says, oh, it forms slowly with a little bit of water and lots and lots of time. The creationist says, no, it formed quickly with a lot of water and a little bit of time. Here we have a fact and two different interpretations of the fact. The problem is many times evolutionists tie their faith-based interpretation of the fact to the actual fact. Both creation and evolution are what? They're both religions, that's exactly right. Unbeknownst to them, they are openly admitting that they are engaging in pseudoscience. They do this so that they can put the disciplines that they tolerate and the disciplines that they don't on a level playing field in an effort to gain a tactical advantage during a discussion. A person who knows how to navigate the arena of public discourse can make a seemingly powerful case to the uninformed, even if this person knows almost nothing about the topic under discussion. This is what lawyers get paid to do. Their job is not to try to determine the reality of a situation, but to present a convincing case. A prosecutor and a public defender can look at an identical set of evidence for a given case, but the arguments that they present will be diametrically opposed because they have been assigned their conclusions from the outset. Suppose a suspect is put on trial in a criminal court. In principle, two lawyers could enter the room and flip a coin to decide who defends and who prosecutes. It does not matter to either of them whether the defendant is guilty or not. All that matters is whether they can convince the judge of the status of the defendant's innocence. Even if a lawyer doesn't mentally accept the position that they represent, there is nothing that can stop them from nevertheless presenting their case, if they so choose. How much will it take to put an end to all this? Fifty hmm? percent of your estate. Fifty uh, percent? With a prenup and proof of adultery? What's your case? Our case is simply this. Hey, 
Scientists, on the other hand, cannot operate like this. A scientist cannot flip a coin to choose which side of an academic issue they accept. Where a lawyer is assigned a position and uses the evidence to synthesize a model that defends that position, a scientist's judgment must remain tabula rasa. All available evidence is interpreted within the appropriate context, meaning that no extraneous, unfalsifiable assumptions need to be made, and that evidence is synthesized into a model with predictive capabilities. There are no presupposed conclusions in science. Maxwell didn't assume that these were the equations of electromagnetism, he derived them to correspond to observation. Einstein didn't assume that time slows down for objects in relative motion. He calculated this result as being a natural and inevitable consequence of the invariance of light speed. Physicists didn't assume that the Higgs boson would have these specific properties. They calculated them decades before by studying the properties of symmetry breaking. The bottom line is this. Scientists don't interpret evidence in a manner that fits an a priori conclusion. This is what separates them from lawyers. By arguing that creationists and so-called evolutionists are looking at the same evidence but interpreting it differently, and that both positions consequently deserve equal consideration, they are openly admitting that they are being lawyers and not scientists. Creationists and evolutionists all have the same evidence. Bill Nye and I have the same Grand Canyon. We don't disagree on that. We will have the same fish fossil, this is one from the Creation Museum, the same dinosaur skeletons, the same animals, the same humans, the same DNA, the same radioactive decay uh, elements that we see. We have the same universe. Actually, we all have the same evidences. It's not the evidences that are different. It's a battle over the same evidence in regard to how we interpret the past. And you know why that is? Because it's really a battle over worldviews and starting points. It's a battle over philosophical worldviews and starting points, but the same evidence. I'm sorry, creationists, but we are not standing on even ground. Not even close. The theories that you deny have predicted the consistency of phylogenetic trees, the cosmic microwave background radiation, the existence of fossils exhibiting intermediate features, the universal distribution of the elements, and helium in particular, the fusion of chromosome 2, the temperature of the background radiation, observed speciation events, and the homogeneity and isotropy of the cosmos, just to list a fraction of the data that they've accurately predicted. And how much has creationism contributed to the sum of human knowledge? What verifiably accurate descriptions of reality has creationism exclusively and parsimoniously been able to provide? None. Absolutely none. The reason for the stunning success of these theories and the miserable failure of creationism is that science works, and creationism is not science. It's as simple as that. Lawyers and scientists both deal with things like evidence and burden of proof, but at the end of the day their methods are fundamentally different, and this is something that creationists who use the same evidence, different interpretation argument simply don't understand. This is the arrogance of creationism, the presumptuous belief that the incoherent ramblings of a primitive buffoon deserve the same respect and consideration as the mind-bogglingly intricate and sophisticated frameworks that have fairly and uncontestably withstood the trial of fire of the academic arena for the past 150 years.